was just, there was an anointing on declaring praise and who God is this morning in the building. I could hardly play piano. My legs were shaking so much. And um, so, you know, come on down or go where you can go because I know some people don't watch from here. But worship is important. And we're going to see exactly why that is a little bit more earlier or later today. But I want to start this morning with a testimony. We don't just show this on Facebook. Uh, Grant puts them up on YouTube. And um, I got it, an email. He typed this out of, of an email that came in. And it said, regarding YouTube video, Esther has a full gospel, number 23, because he numbers them all. June 6, 2021, Truth and Reconciliation, God's Response to Kamloops. And I thought it was really profound that this person sent it this week because of Thursday. It was Truth and Reconciliation Day. And he said, Gates Dubois, gave me his name. He said, from a member of the Cree tribe, Hai Hai. And I tried to get a tutorial on how to say that earlier today, so if I messed it up, I'm really sorry. But I thought it was really honoring that he did that. And he said, that means thank you. I had a lot of anger in my heart, and I blamed God for a lot for what I went through. But hearing your words, it touched my heart and opened my eyes and my mind to the will of God. And God's will is always healing and restoration. And he said, you took the anger away from my heart. Thank you. And I didn't do that. The Holy Spirit did. But I wanted to share that because we, sh we shoot these things out every week and we have no idea whose life is changed because they watch it. He's, I don't know where he's from, but somehow he found our video and God used it to heal his heart. And I just want to declare some things because I think it's really, really important. Um, that we know truth, and I'm going to just say, you know, the media is the media, but truth and reconciliation actually started in 2010. I'm not saying that because I know I'm saying that because many, many First Nations spiritual leaders across Canada said we started then, but the news didn't cover it. So, and the reason I'm saying that is because Thursday's come and gone, but there's a one heart. Uh, conference going on out in Kamloops. They, they didn't just wear shirts and walk around with people for a day as, as much as that said, hey, we're paying attention. They stayed to pray and to look into people's eyes and to minister the healing of God because it's going gonna, it's gonna to keep going until God's done because that's what he does because he's not interested in it not being healed. He's not interested in there not being reconciliation. And the one thing above everything that he's really interested in is truth, because it's who Jesus is. And when they get a revelation of truth, then we get set free. And it's really, really important that, that we declare healing, because forgiveness, forgiveness is the, the key that opens the door. You know, if Brant pokes my button, a, I have a few, probably. But, if, you know, and, and I get hurt and my heart gets hurt. I can, and I do, you ask the person to forgive you. Or they ask you to, he can ask me, will you forgive me? And I can say yes. That does not, this is what we have to understand, that doesn't heal our hearts. Forgiveness doesn't heal our hearts. It opens us up spiritually so that God can heal our hearts. So it's this process, but to, to, to have this concept that we're going to have healing without God, see, that's not truth. So I'm just, I got my ear to another channel and to, to some First Nations spiritual leaders in the country, and I listen to their words. I listen to what they say more than I listen to the news because they're carrying the heart of God for their people, and, and it's a beautiful thing. So I just want to declare that that. This thing we're doing every Sunday morning, which there's lots of Sundays, I go home and I go, well, I don't know, God, why are we doing this? And when I read that, I started to weep. Because if we can change one person's life, that's huge. That's huge. So I just want to share that because we're all in this together. <laughs> As the body of Christ, we are. Okay, now I want to share something else. 
uh, before I speak, uh, a few weeks ago at prayer, I was getting ready for prayer, and I heard the Lord say something, and I thought maybe you guys would be interested in hearing what he said. So I'm going to read it to you. And he, I heard him say, I'm just getting started with like this little bit of attitude. And I just kind of, I just did the, you know, Caswell one eyebrow raise thing at the Lord. And, and then he said it again, I'm just getting started. And I said, I understand what you're saying, but if I, if I say this to people, they're going to hear, I was just sitting by the sidelines doing nothing and now I'm going to act. And he laughed. And you might think that that's a little bit ridiculous, but you should read Psalm number two. It talks about that. I'm going to read it. Okay. There are going to be some word coming out today. If I can find Psalm. I had it in Psalm two, and then I pulled my paper out to talk to you, so I lost it. It's really important. Why do the nations, that's the key word. If I had, if I had candy, and on occasions I've had candy, and I've thrown it to people when I've said the key word, because I think adults should have as much fun in church as the kids do downstairs. But the key word for today, and there will be no candy, is nations. <laughs> okay. Why do the nations assemble with commo commotion, uproar, and confusion of voices? And why do the people imagine and devise an empty scheme? The kings of the earth take their places. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ. Just in case you thought this was about you, it's not. They say, let us break God's bands of restraint asunder and cast their cords of control from us. We are not going to be under God. And then it says this, he who sits in the heavens laughs laughs the lord has them in derision and in supreme contempt contempt he mocks them he speaks to them in his deep anger and he troubles them in 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 his displeasure and fury saying i have anointed installed and placed my king jesus firmly on my holy hill Whew. so it's really i just thought i'd in case you were upset because God laughed. You know, don't let that trigger you. It's a good thing. So, this is what he, because then he kept talking. After he laughed, I was like, okay. He said, I've been setting up the board. I've been placing people, players, and provision exactly where I want them to be. I know the end from the beginning. And I realized this week, I know the end from the beginning. I always say that about God. Do I not say that a lot? Yes. And and I just I was walking down my hallway and I went, Oh, I know the end from the beginning. I don't know all I don't I might not know all the in-betweens, but I sure know how this is gonna end. He said, Your eyes are just being open to many things, to many events, and to many people. The devil never makes a move that I do not know about it beforehand. Because we always go, <gasps> and so we think God does too. It is time for my church to start reacting from that place. The place of, God, you knew this was coming. What do you want us to do? The enemy has been plotting and running around playing a game that I'm not playing. <laughs> I laughed at that. I thought, they're going to be so disappointed to hear. God's like, I'm not playing with you. I mean, is this it's doing anything in your heart? Yeah. All the while, they are unaware that I'm setting up the real board with the real players, with the real power, and with the real rules. Good word? Good. So we're going to keep going from that place today. Oh, my goodness. We have one choice. We say one. one. Like, this is it, really. And this is always it, and it's never going to be anything else. Just so you know. We are either going to filter everything through the truth that God is ruler over all the nations of the earth and we're going to e view events through that lens or we're not. That's it. And this scripture came up because Brent started to read a portion in prayer 
two Tuesdays ago, and and that phrase he and we'll get to it in a minute came up and 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 it's like the Holy Spirit shines a spotlight on something. I am ruler over all the nations, and, I, and it was just there was just such a weightiness on it, that truth, and God said, you know, um, Charlene, the the my people have gotten into that place of intimacy with me, and we've really worked on developing intimacy with with God, with the Holy Spirit, so that we can hear his voice. And it's just, Jesus, he's the lover of my soul. And it's a beautiful thing. He said, but they kind of got a little myop, myopic. It's just like, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and God's my heavenly Father, and he loves me, and he cares for me. And we got into the intimacy, and he said, and it's like they forgot the truth that the one that they're intimate with is the ruler over all the nations. My daddy bigger than your daddy, right? And so now when all of this stuff is happening, we're going, oh God, where are you? And we're looking at our individual lives and we're looking like this instead of being up there with him looking down going, what are you about to do? Because those are two different viewpoints and intimacy is great and we need it to hear God but we need, to, we need to not make him less than who he is, and we need to stay in that position. We need to stand in that position. So I'm going to give you a really, really big picture, and then we're going to look at two Old Testament stories and one New Testament story, okay? The really, really big picture, because God is ruler over all the nations, is that mankind is made in God's image. So every people group on the planet has a strength or a characteristic or a trait that reflects part of God. It's like he's peeled off layers of himself and put them on different people. When, when we're redeemed, we reflect God. When, when those traits aren't redeemed, they don't. Okay, but all of us together are <coughs> made in his image. And then in, right at the beginning, it says when we found out we were, they were in unity and they started to build the Tower of Babel because they wanted to rule over everything, God said, oh, They've got this unity thing, nothing. But, but sin had come into the world, right? And they stepped out from under God's authority and rulership. So then they were under the, the devils. And he said, boy, nothing's going to be impossible for them to do, so I'm going to mix up their languages. And he did. So it's like unity and having the whole world in unity and we're all, as we're all together, you know, that, that we're, we are reflecting the image of God. Well, oh, that sounds like one world government. What a great idea. That's the perfect solution. Don't throw rocks at me. <laughs> no, it's not because it's Satan's counterfeit. You read in Isaiah, he's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. There is one and the government without end is on his shoulders and Jesus is the head. So that's where, what we had, that's what we lost, and that's what we're coming back to. But you got to know that the counterfeit's out there. And the devil, he really, really wants to be the head. He's called the Antichrist. That's what God calls him. Now, God did design us to live in peace. He designed us to live blessed lives and to be a blessing to one another under his government. Jesus died and he rose again. I've, I've heard this, you know, it's just like, you know, we need to not worry about any of that stuff. It's just the church just needs to be, you know, the spiritual thing. He did die and rise again so that we could be spiritually free. But he designed us from the very beginning of time to live free and to live responsible for ourselves and not to have everybody else telling us what to do. I know, it's just I can't believe she said that, but it has to be said. Because if the church isn't going to be lining up with what God said things are supposed to be, it's not going to come from anywhere else. He is the peace that breaks down every dividing wall between people. Every people group on the planet. There is unity when we're under the headship of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we get along. Because we are walking out his purposes and plans on the earth. So everything else is a counterfeit, and it's a mess, and it's ugly, and it doesn't care who it kills and destroys because it's Satan, and he comes to kill, steal, and destroy because he wants to rule. Now, if we take the time to read all those Old Testament books that the devil tries to tell people are boring, 
and they have nothing to do with life today, and there's nothing in there for you personally, if we read them, we will have a paradigm shift about God. That's where you see that he is ruler over all the nations. That's where we see how he set up his body, the church, to function and to help govern. And that's where we see that he is very, very intricately involved in the details of governments of the nations from the beginning of time till Revelation. So it's not like if you want to go read your Bible from, please go read your Bible. <laughs> if you're falling apart and your head's coming unglued and you're fighting fear, just get in the word and stay there till it's gone because you'll look at it and, and it's like, <sighs> we need this perspective. This tells us this is what God has always done from the beginning of time. This is what he's going to do at the end and we're here. Looking at all of that, we, we can't possibly go, he's, he's on a holiday or having a coffee break. He's never taken a holiday. And it would be espresso, not coffee, just saying. <laughs> so this is what he did. He had prophets. Please, read your, read your Bible from this perspective for fun. Just get out and just start writing down. This is what was happening in this nation. This is what God did. This is what happened this nation. This is what God did. I dare you. I dare you to start doing that. Because your whole world's going to get rocked upside down from what it is now if you're living in fear. There is no possible way we could have any anxiety about what's going on right now. But the only thing that's going to break it off is the word of God. Did I mention I'd like you to read your Bibles? Just check it. So... What he did is he had prophets speak to the kings and the leaders of government. He would send his prophet. And the prophet, and it wasn't just Israel and Judah. See, if you go back and read Ezekiel, because I remember going like, where's Edom? I don't know where Edom is. Where's this, you know, and, there's, and then he talks to Nineveh, and then he talks to Babylon, and he talks to City, and it's like, it's like, you know, but now you go back and read it. He sends his prophets to address every government in the world. He can do that. Make a list. And then this is what, I'm just paraphrasing, but this is kind of what, a shortened version of what God says all the way through that when he's addressing nations. He said, I did this. I lifted you up and made you great. I used you to fulfill my plan. But, even though you fulfilled my purpose, I'm going to destroy you now. Because you are evil and you are full of pride and you refuse to humble yourself before me. Even knowing that I was using you to be an instrument to deal with another nation. Because he, he knows what's in people's hearts. He knows what's in government leaders' hearts. He knows what's in the, in, in the people's hearts. And by the way, just so you know, if you don't understand this theologically, this was all before Jesus came. So they all went into, into um, paradise, like Abraham's bosom, whatever. And then when Jesus died and rose again, because there was foretelling of it, he's just gonna, they're just going to want, and he's like, are you going to accept me or not? Everybody gets an opportunity. So don't go, oh, God, killed a bunch of people. Can, can I, how is it okay for really, really evil men to kill a bunch of people, but God, in, if in his justice, says, hey, this isn't okay, and he says, your life is over now, on earth, that's not okay in God's mean. But it's okay to kill babies, just threw that in there. Gee, it's probably going to be in every message that I preach till Jesus comes. Whew. When people say that church should be separated from the state, they're speaking a lie. Because it's in the truth of God's word, it shouldn't be. Amen? Yeah. Because that was never God's intent. And they're declaring by saying that that God doesn't care about us, that he doesn't care about our everyday lives, that he doesn't care about what things we're going through on the earth. Because our day-to-day -day activities, if you haven't noticed, are hugely affected by governments all over the world. Correct? Yeah. So saying that God says, oh, don't have anything to do with that and your life's kind of hell on earth a little bit, and that that's okay, and he's a good and kind and loving God, this is, does not make sense, because it's not true. So what happened is 
is he had halfway through Israel hanging out in, in, in the promised land, all of a sudden they looked around and they said, we want a king. We want to be like the other nations. And I was always like, yeah, how exactly did they do that without government? But they did. They had spiritual government, that was the priests, and they had judges that they dealt with the legal stuff. This is, and people went to the judges. But when it came to day-to-day -day stuff, it's like, you know what, there's a whole bunch of potholes between my house and yours, let's get together and fix the road. And because God said, you're gonna have to pay taxes to the king. He told them, I'll give you what you want. Don't get me going on how much tax we pay. And then they spend it on what they want and not what we need. Because we're starting to notice, boy, there's a deficit of a whole bunch of things that we need. But there's no money for that. Which is a lie. So family, priests, and judges were how the country ran. It was good. And for everything else, everybody was responsible for their own lives. And they grouped together for protection, and they grouped together for all kinds of things. Now, Satan counterfeits things. Did I say that already? I'm not repeating myself. I'm just going to tell you another area. Instead of prophets, he has the media. Because most of the media is declaring what he wants to happen. Mm -hmm. We kind of, I stole that from somebody else, but as soon as I heard it, I went, whoa, that's God. Because it really helps you identify that. If you call the media, and, and it's not all media, but you know what, if, if you call it a prophet from Satan, why are you letting that speak into your life and declaring how you should feel? How about we listen to the prophets of God and what they're saying? Amen? Oh, she is preaching good this morning. Call it what it is. Okay. Jesus came to give us awesome, abundant, overwhelmingly amazing life. And the devil, he wants to oppress, he wants to depress, and he wants to dominate us. Period. Now, God gave us, and he continues to give us free will as individuals and as nations. So when we honor God and we live the way he designed for us to live and we bless Israel, that's in there. Live the way that I set it up and bless Israel. When we invite him into our lives, not just into our hearts, I, I, want, you to, I, I, I want you to be my Lord and my Savior. Take away my sin. I'm going to give you my life because I don't, want, I don't want Satan to govern over me. I want you to govern over me. We've invited him into our lives. We invite the Holy Spirit to come and baptize us. We ask him. We need to continue. This is how it works in the spirit realm. We need to ask him into every situation. And instead of asking him into situations, we are watching for things to get better. But we're not inviting God into what's going on. And that's how it works. I know that because I read the book. Okay, now if we choose to overload on information from sources that lie, we are only going to see problems and we won't hear and see the solutions. You're not going to hear and see the solutions unless you're in the Word of God and unless you're listening to the Lord. But then when we do, we have a huge frame of reference. I told you this is what God has done and he's going to do it again because he is the same yesterday, today, forever. He doesn't change. So these, this is biblical historical precedents. These aren't stories like Rapunzel and Black Beauty. This is a historical account of God's dealing with mankind from the beginning of time till the end. And it sets precedents. So then we can stay in peace and we have a proven template for prayer. How do I pray? Confidently. People who read the word and know the word of God, they, they're good at praying. Just saying. I remember I remember I'm going like, we went to this church, we moved, and I'm like, dang, these guys pray with confidence I've never heard people pray with before. Like they pray different than me. And they don't rehearse the problem. They just quote in scripture left and right. 
but I heard the confidence of the Holy Spirit breathing through it and bringing change. So, whoo! We need to see God in his fullness. We need to see him accurately. Okay, so where I started, I started with 2 Chronicles 20, which Brent had read, where um, Jehoshaphat made that statement. But I don't want to start with Jehoshaphat today. These are the two Old Testament stories. Are you ready? Because I'm going to tell you what not to do, and then we're going to talk about what to do. And when we look at King Jehoshaphat and we look at King Ahab, Jehoshaphat was king over Judah. Uh, Ahab was king over Israel, and they were contemporaries. They were reigning at the same time. Same time. Okay? They both had armies come against them. One responded one way, one responded the other. Okay? And I'm going to start with the don't do this. Okay? Gotcha. And we're going to look at it, and we're going to say, oh, I think I see some of this in the world today. Okay? And then when we're done, these two, we're going to look, because, yes, the Lord deals with nations, but he deals with us as individuals. And we can feel like in the middle of this, I didn't ask for this, God. I did not want this to happen. This is not my idea of a good time, and I'm totally out of control. Can, can you put your hand up if in the last, you know, since March or two, that you feel like at some point in time, I'm out of control? Everybody put your hand up. Do you know why? Because we are. But if we are, then we know what to do about it. Because both of these situations were out of human control to fix and change. Okay, 1 Kings 20. Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, and his name means son of the storm god. Just kind of throw that out there. Feel like we've been in a storm. And 32 kings were with him. And this is the thing, it would be like, Yorkton is Ben-Hadad, and then, you know, Tantal and Atwater Banger, all these other kings. Because they had little city-states, right? With, you know, great-great-granddad had 120 million kids. In the, okay, I'm exaggerating. And so they all ruled their little things, but they would get together and do stuff. And they were coming against God's people. And he sent messengers, Facebook messengers, to them. Uh-huh. And they, this is what they said. They sent it to the king, and they, he, they said, Your silver and your gold are mine. Your wives and your children, even the fairest, also are mine. And the king of Israel answered and said, My lord, O king, according to what you say, I'm yours and all that I have. I'm sorry, but I, if I'm his wife, we're going to have words. <laughs> That's your answer? Listen. You have to understand what happened. They would come, and they would conquer, and if the king didn't resist, he got to sit at the conquering king's table, which means every single meal, as you sat lower down, you remember that he had all your stuff. And you're still living, but you gave up all your stuff. And you let people die. Boy, he had a lot of wives. I don't know what Brent would do with just one wife taking him on for that, but these guys have a lot. And all their kids. All, do you understand? That was their future. Their children. They gave away their future. Are you okay with that? I'm not. Okay. So he said, okay, deal, done deal. So then they came back the next day. And they said, although I said I want all of that, now I want everything else. I'm going to search through your house and the houses of your servants. I'm going to come into your home and there's nothing you can do about it and I'm going to take your stuff. And anything I look at that I want, I'm going to take it away. See, he, called, he said, sure, sure, you can have this. And they said, no, well, I want more. It's like, okay. But he didn't want to fight. He just wanted, just as long as I'm okay, I'm willing to let everything, I'm just, I just don't want it. And you know, in Canada, we're a little bit like this. We don't like conflict. It's the, in, it's the inversion and the perversion of the strength that God put into us that causes us to be underneath the heel of the oppressor. So listen to this. Circle this word. Then, after he came back the second day and he said, Then, the king of Israel called all the elders of the land. 
It's like, you made this decision without having it. Don't you know wisdom is, is in the multitude of counselors? Have you not read? You're, Solomon wrote Proverbs already. He should have known this. But he made a decision all by himself that affected everybody else and never talked to one single person about it. There's little nuances here. I hope you're getting it. Who? Then he called the elders of the land. He said, no, look and see how this man is seeking our destruction. <clears throat> he sent to me for my wives, my children, my silver, my gold, and I didn't refuse him. And all the elders and the people said to him, don't listen. Don't consent to that. What is your problem? So he said, this is what he said. All your first, I'll, I'll give you the first thing you asked for, but not the second. That's where I draw the line. And then, you know, King Ben Haddad and Ahab did a little bit of chest thumping of who's bigger and better and stronger. And, yeah. And then, who? A prophet. Doesn't even say the guy's name. A prophet. You know why? Because, just so you know, uh, King Ahab was killing the prophets. So I don't know who this guy is, but he's a brave man. And he dared to come and say, this is what God says. I love this. He said, thus says the Lord, have you seen all this great multitude? I love the rhetorical questions. Yeah, that's why I said, yes, you can have my stuff, because it looks bigger than me. He said, behold, I will deliver it into your hand today, and you shall know and realize that I'm the Lord. In other words, I am ruler over all these other nations. I am above them. And then Ahab says this, by whom? Who's going to do this? Because I'm not. I gave my stuff away. I don't want to fight. And he said, thus says the Lord, by the young men, the attendants of the bodyguards of the governors of the districts. And it ends up that there was 232 of them. And there's this phrase in the Bible. It talks about the time when the kings went out to war. So whenever there was a war, and Ahab did it lots. He got together with Jehoshaphat, and they did it, and then they... Connected again, and a prophet said, Jehoshaphat, don't hang out with this guy. Not going to end well. So he turned around and went home. Listen to the prophet. They always did. His, he was a mighty warrior. Sitting on his hoo-ha. So then he says, well, who's going to lead them? Who's going to order the battle? Duh! That's like the number one requirement on your job list. King leads in the battles. The prophet said, you are. He's a bummer. I don't want to do that. Who, but, but he's actually asking, who's going who's gonna to be, you say this is going to happen and God's going to do it. Who's going to make this happen? Sure. Who's going to make this happen? I can't. <laughs> My plan's better. I'm going to live. So, yeah. Um, they saw them kind of coming. 232 people spread out over the country is really not that big. There were 7,000 behind them. But <laughs> the King, King Van Haddad and all, his, and all of the other, like, what was it, 38 guys or whatever, they're having a party. They are so confident. We are seeing this. They are partying. They are so confident that they're going to win this battle. They're getting drunk in the middle of the day. And they're coming. They said, hey, we see a little bit of movement out there. And he goes like, oh, yeah, go get them, dead or alive. Like, you know, just surround them, bring them back alive, so we can play with them for a little bit. He just thought it was, there was no way he was going to lose. Except that God said, did you, did, you, uh, did you not forget? I will deliver this multitude into your hand today. What is God saying? Period. That's it. So, they went and they defeated them all because God made it happen. By the way, they had to deal with this because they came back a few times. And then eventually God dealt with Ahab because he's a wicked leader. He was not a good leader. So this is the other thing. When you, when you look at stuff, you, we need to understand it's like God, you know what's in this heart and it, do you... If you need to deliver us from this leader, if he's not going to repent, deliver us from this leader and give us a good one. 
and that's how but this is this is a really important because this is what we're hitting in the spirit realm is a whole bunch of people going like if we just go along with it everything will be okay okay let's see what happened with Jehoshaphat this is in 2nd Chronicles 20 the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the Meunites came against Jehoshaphat, and it was told, A great multitude has come against you from beyond the Dead Sea, and they're in, in Gedi. And then it says, this is important, it says, Then Jehoshaphat feared. And you have, to, you have to not just read the Bible sometimes. You have to look up on that program on your computer that I tell you, like, for 15 years now you should get this program on your computer. Because if you tap the word feared when you look it up in there, it's not <laughs> feared. It's reverence. As soon as he heard that, he went into reverence and awe of God. It says, and he set himself determinedly as his vital need to seek the Lord. He proclaimed a fast in Judah. And Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. Even out of every city, they came to seek the Lord yearning for him with all their hearts. He didn't make a decision that affected everybody else's life without calling them together to pray. Different response? There have been leaders of nations over the earth that have prayed. There's a biblical perspective for it and there's a historical outside of the Bible. It's true. And they've called for, for times of, of fasting. We have not had a leader in our government that has called for the people to pray. But in March, early April, we did call for a fast across Canada. And should all of the churches where Jesus is actually Lord had come, if we see, nobody could see what was coming. So we're just like, we're just going to wait two weeks and everything will be okay. What would have happened if somebody had stood up and said, you need to call your church to prayer and we, you need to gather together and you need to fast and pray every night until this breaks. We go, I got, you know, Netflix and stuff to watch. Well, in hindsight... Maybe if, if the church across Canada had prayed every night and fasted and come together, we would have heard some stuff from God and we would have started to declare and change some things in the spirit realm and we wouldn't be in this situation. And you go like, well, you know, but whatever. It's like, I'm sorry, there's countries all over the world that are no longer in lockdowns and we're not one of them. So I just would like to take a little bit of responsibility for that, wouldn't you? Just threw that out there. It gets better. It gets more fun. But I have to say that. And we're still, and now we're at this point, people are losing their jobs, and it's like, well, you know, I'm okay. Nobody's asking me for a paper, so I'm okay. Well, I'm not okay. So maybe the church needs to get together and start to fast and pray. I'm just, I'll just, well, let's see what they did. Because this is our template for prayer. Okay. So Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court, and he said, if you want to pray anything this week, Second Chronicles 20, verse 6. Pray it ten times a day. O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? Rhetorical question. Yes. And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? Yes. You might have to say that 20 times a day. You are the Lord who rules over all the kingdoms of all the nations. In your hand are power and might so that none is able to withstand you. Listen, when God does something, it doesn't matter. What people are doing, God's stuff is going to happen. Okay, so then he, he recorded. What he did is he went over the history of where God all helped him in the past. Oh, kind of like I'm telling you here. Okay, but we'll skip those verses. Go to verse 12. He said, O oh, our God, will you not exercise judgment upon them? For we have no might. We are powerless. We have no might to, to stand against this great company that's coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. We are not on Facebook. We're looking at you. 
And all Judah stood, which is, an, which is a posi- uh, posture of honor before the Lord, with their children and their wives, and they waited. And they had a, a prophet. Same thing. God spoke to both things through a prophet. And this is what the prophet said. Whew. And you know what's really cool? They mention the prophet's name, and then they mention his dad and his grandpa and his great-grandpa and his great-great-grandpa. There's, there's a reason for that. It's like, oh. okay, we're not going there today, but that's a good thing. He said, hearken all Judah. Listen, you guys. Listen, all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and listen, King Jehoshaphat. The Lord says this. Be not afraid or dismayed at this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. See, we think this is our fight. This is not our fight. If you think this is your fight, you do not know what's going on. There are two agendas in the world. There's the agenda of Jesus Christ, and there is the agenda of the Antichrist. And it's not the Antichrist time, but he's trying to make it, and that's everything is going to fall into one of those two categories. This battle is not ours. It's God's. Okay. Tomorrow go down to them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the ravine before the wilderness. He doesn't say you'll start to fight them there. He said you'll find them, which is a really cool thing because the next line says this, you shall not need to fight in this battle. Oh, thank you, God, because we really don't want to fight. Not because we don't. They fought lots, but this one was unfightable. It was unwinnable on their own. And, and there were some battles that maybe we could have fought with being involved in things in our communities, and I know some of you have been in, in, in our government and in the educational system, and all kinds of things we could have been involved, but we're past those battles. We're at the unwinnable one. Was that a little too negative? No. It's just the truth, because if you don't tell yourself the truth, you're not going to hear from God. It's like, God, they said, God, we cannot win this without you. Can we just say this? God, we can't win this without you but you are ruler of all the nations. Yeah, okay, amen. He said, take your position. See the deliverance of the Lord who is with you. Fear not or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them. And then Jehoshaphat, in front of everybody, he gets on his face and he bows down and he just worships God, the leader of the nation, in front of them all. Just, God, you're you're awesome and magnificent. Maybe he repeated verse 6. I don't know. But he was just declaring how good and awesome and wonderful God is. And the priests, then they had this rocking, shouting, loud praise time. While he's on his face, other guys are like just declaring the praises of God. It, it, there's more. Because we don't want to do the other one. We want to do this one, so we have to get it all. Okay. <gasps> Woo! With a very loud voice. So they went up early the next morning. They actually did... They didn't stay at home. They actually did what the prophet told them to do. And as you're going out, this is what the king said. Believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe and remain steadfast to his prophets and you shall prosper. He just said, you guys, no matter what, what goes on, you're going to have to stay believing it. And you're gonna have, we're going to have to do what he said. And then it says, when he had consulted with the people... See, we always say, oh, King Jehoshaphat sent this, the worship team out front. He didn't. They all got together and said, King, we got this prophetic word. How should we walk this out? And it's like, well, if we don't have to fight, let's just worship. Okay. So they decided to send the worship team out. It wasn't the king's decision. The people were in it. They're like, we are on this page. We're going to do what the prophet said. And then they just worshiped. By the way, if you're in a battle that is unwinnable, unless he gives you something specific to do, and there's illustrations all the way through, we worship loudly. We kind of did this morning, declaring who God is. So they went out, and they gave thanks to the Lord. Oh, God, tear down our enemies. Oh, God, you're stronger. It wasn't that kind of praise. God, we thank you. You're so awesome. Woo! See, sometimes we think that our, that our warfare praise has to be like, taking on the enemy. It's just like, thank you, God. You're so good. I can make up a little song, but I'll spare you. Okay. 
who, when they began to sing and praise, the Lord sent ambushments against the men. And what happened was, you got to know there's angels involved in this. So I, and they got swords, just so you know. So they're like ready to go, and somebody pokes them from behind. And they're like, and they think the guy poked him, so they take a swipe at him. And all of a sudden they think, I thought you were on my side. And this whole mess, and they just, they destroy themselves in mutually destructive wars. They killed each other. By the way, there's a little bit of that going on. So I'm just good to be thanking God till it's done. Because we don't need to fight the enemy there. See, the, I told you this before, the devil, nothing in the, in the hierarchy in the demonic realm is, <coughs> they don't like each other. So they, you know, and they're all struggling for power, so they destroy themselves. So whatever um, demonic forces were over each of those nations, they, they went at each other. So it is going on. If you can't see it, you just have to trust me. Soon everybody will be able to see it. It's coming. <gasps> Whoo! And the good news is, yeah, they came, and when they got to the place where God said, hey, there, you'll see them, they saw them. All dead. And they went, wow, there's a whole lot of spoil there. And they, they, their lives became richer. And I, don't, I haven't heard that from God, but I have heard many, many prophets say, when we get through this mess, there's going to be blessing on the world. There's going to be financial blessing. It's going to be financial blessing for people that need it. Amen? Okay. So, are you with that? Are we good? you got to decide as an individual whether you're going to react like King Ahab or whether you're going to react like King Jehoshaphat. And I think as, as a church we need to decide, okay, God, what are we going to do? So we just, we're just hitting praise. And, and we're going to do what we're seeking the Lord. We're going to do what he tells us to do. But we're not gonna we're not gonna bow down to anything the enemy says to do. That's all I'm gonna say about that. But we're not. Because he's not in control. He's not the government that's over all the other governments God is. So we're gonna do what God says. Now, for those of us who are facing extreme personal stress right now, I want to turn to Acts twenty seven. I'm gonna close out with Paul here. Paul's you know, preaching the gospel to kings. And he goes through this whole process, and, and they could have set him free, but he said, no, I want to go see the king in Rome. Because God had told him, I'm sending you to Rome. So if, if you know that God has a purpose and a plan for your life, and we all have one, we just might not all know what it is. And if you don't know, you should ask him. Because God told him what he was going to do, he lived through the situation from that perspective. God said this. So it doesn't matter what else happens, God said this. So he gets on a boat. Now he gets on a boat with a centurion who's like ahead of a hundred century, okay? And, and he's, he has favor with this man, with this man that's guarding him. And so they get in a boat and they go a little bit and then they stop at this place to, you know, refuel and get new supplies. And the centurion lets him go and go hang out with his buddies. There was this word when I was in high school called koinonia. We're going to have, anybody remember that? We'll have koinonia. And I'm like, that's sad. I hope none of my friends come to church because if they say that word, they're going to think we're weird. It actually, it's a Greek word and it means fellowship. It means connection. And if you are at home and you are not connected because when COVID started, you disconnected, you need to repent because there's something spiritually vital that happens when we connect. And you need to get to be part of a church that's listening to God and hearing God and praising the rooftops off and praying for people and that are getting together with people no matter what. From now on, no more separation. Because this was really vital. Before he went on to the next part of his journey, it says that Paul was refreshed 
and cared for. And there is something happens at church when we hang out together. I go home happier than when I came and I'm happy. Something changes. And it's vital. And we cannot live without it. God designed. And there are things as we talk with one another that get birthed. And vision gets birthed. And, and we get encouraged and strengthened in a way because God designed it to function that way. Well, I can just be at home and I'm okay. It's a lie. It's a lie. Do it. I, I'll tell you, there's people that fight hard to get here on Sunday. And my heart is so full for that because I know they pay a price to get here. It just blows me away with the beauty of it. And God honors that. So he's on the boat, and they go to another place, and then they go to another place, and they're trying to get there before winter hits. It was October. And Paul's praying. He's talking to God. And they decide, we're going to go, we're going to get, and we're going to get on this boat, and they transfer it to this other boat. And there's two things. So there's the, there's the soldiers, there's all the, which represents the army, which represents government. And then there was commerce. Money! We got all our bales of whatever on board. And Paul said, yeah, no, I've been talking to God, you need to not go. And they're like, we are not going to lose our money, we're going. It might be worth a little bit less if we wait. So they didn't listen to him. And then they get out there. And, you know, it looked good when we started. And the storm hits like nothing they've ever seen. This is where we are. We're in the storm that nobody saw coming. So are you panicking? Or are you hanging out like Paul and just praying and saying, Okay, God. And you know what? When... when when they got to a certain point, Paul stood up and he said, Hey, you guys, you didn't listen to me, but you should have. Quite boldly. And he, he said, We're going to lose the ship. We're going to lose everything on it. The guys are so worried about your money. He said, You'd have been better off if you'd listened to me and waited until spring. It's all going down. He said, But an angel of the Lord came and the angel smacked him. Hey! He said, God's been listening to you, and he told you you're going to Rome. So you're not going to die. So I don't know who needs to hear this, but you're not going to die. If you know that God's like, I am here for a purpose, and I'm here till he's done with me. My body's not my own. My life is not my own. I don't have to worry about anything. Because I'm going to do what God tells me to do, and then I get to go to heaven. See, I know how the story ends. And he said, and because you prayed, no one else on the ship will die. I don't know who needs to shift their thought process, but there are people watching you. And if we as believers are going, ah, I really wanted to do this big screen, but I'm just self-control. It's like, if we're losing it and they're watching us, everybody's going through the storm. We are all going through it, but we had better be going through it differently because people are watching. So then he said, I know you're nauseous. I know you've been puking for 14 days. But it's time to eat something because you're going to need enough sustenance and energy to swim because we're going to have to swim to shore. And it all happened how he said it's going to happen. But the story wasn't over. That's my favorite part. They get to the island. Paul just, he doesn't think he's better than anybody else. He's picking up sticks to put on the fire because it started, not only were they wet, it started to rain. It was fall, so it's cool. I've never been to Malta. They figured out they were in Malta in October, but I'm going to go home and check the temperature now because I never thought to do it before. So he's helping build a fire, and he's picking up these sticks, and this serpent thingy, viper, bites his hand, and he goes like this. Why does he do that? And just keep, why? Because he read his, he read. Jesus said, you could drink poisonous things, snakes can bite you, you're not going to die. Okay? So he went, oh, snake. And kept, hello. We got to read, we got to read the word, church, more than we have ever had to read it before. Okay, point. Okay, okay, you made your point three or four times, Charlene. Okay. Okay. 
So everybody's watching him. What's going to happen? Surely this guy, by the way, they wanted to kill him, the, the other soldiers, because if if the guy you were guarding got away and you came back and you say he got away, nothing happens now. They send Dog the bounty hunter to look for him, right? But for them, if you came home without your guy, they just sword right there. You're done. They killed you right there on the spot. That's how the Roman government kind of ran things. So they were like, yeah, no, this guy's going to get on this island. He's going to go hide somewhere and we're going we're to lose him and whatever. Cause, and they wanted to kill him. And again, the captain of the guard said no. So again... If God's sending you to Rome, you don't have to worry. Okay. So then, he's, they're going, he's not swelling up. He's not falling over. Well, they had, to, they had no watches, and it was cloudy, so they couldn't look at the sun. But they knew time had passed. <laughs> he's going, he should be dead by now. They knew the local flora and fauna. They knew those snakes were poisonous. They waited for him to die, and he didn't. So Satan's trying again to kill him and God's going oh you shouldn't have done that one because they all watched him shake it off and then they went I don't know who this guy is a prisoner but like maybe he's a god because that's the way their heads thought but because he didn't get sick and die from it they looked at him through a different lens and the guy who ran the whole island the ruler of the whole island his father-in-law was very very sick he was dying and they said to Paul will you come and Pray for my dad. And Paul did, and he got healed. And the whole island gave their life to Christ. The entire island got saved. Devil's going, dang, shouldn't it shouldn't have shipwrecked them? Shouldn't have sent that snake. I right? God God just goes like he the devil is not gonna he's he's not seeing what's coming. The problem is the church isn't seeing what's coming. Woo! We have to open our eyes. Because it's good. It's good. The devil's not going to know what hit him. But the ruler of all the nations is, a, is about to move in a way he has never moved before. And this is, you know what? This is whatever God wants to happen is going to happen. And it's not just Canada. It is literally every nation on the planet and everything's intertwined because the devil wants to have one world government where he's ruling things and God's just going like, no, and I haven't had my final outpouring yet and you're really going to hurt at that one. And when I say, when I take my church and I say, okay, give it your best shot, that's when the devil gets his moment. So it's not now. But we need to wake up. We need to open our eyes. We need to see what's going on in the spirit realm. And we need to declare, God, you are ruler over all the nations, including Canada. Amen? Okay. So, takeaway. You know, I, I love those churches that have takeaway points for today. I always have like 40. Sorry. <laughs> but if I could give you one, read your Bible. Get a little notebook and say, I wonder if she's right. I'm right. I know because I've read it a few times. Okay? And I want to encourage you, if you can, to come to prayer. And and we're just going to meet with the board. And if we just if we feel that God's calling our church to fast and pray. I don't like fasting either. Just you know, there's not some spiritual thing that makes it easier. Or it's it's not my favorite thing to do. But I can do it. We can all fast something. And it's like, well, I don't know what to pray. Just get to, just get to the meeting. Let's just sit there together. And they just they just stood before the Lord and said, okay, God, what do you want us to do? Okay, God, we, we need you to come into our nation. We need you to come into our province. We can do that. See, we need to ask. We need to invite him into this because he's up there waiting. And I don't know where the tipping point is, but I want to be part of it. I want to be part of it that shifts. Amen? So let's stand and say, Father, we invite you into Canada. This multitude is too strong for us. But you are Lord. You are ruler. 
over all the nations. And we declare that through us, your body, your church, that you will rule Canada. And it will be good. We thank you because you are our deliverer. Amen. And Father, I pray for grace on people who are hitting things um, in an individual place. People have different levels of battle. So I just want to, um, Father, release your grace, your strength and your grace to everyone that's watching that's, that's really facing an intense personal battle right now. Father, we join our faith all together. You put us in a body, and I release your grace. God, you might have to have food show up on our counters. I don't know what you're going to have to do, but it's not going to be anything that's hard for you. It's not going to be things you haven't done before. So, God, we're just going to ask, and then we're going to thank you. You're good, and we love you. Amen. Amen.